Hello, Hi, everybody. everybody. Welcome, Hello. welcome. Yes. Welcome, welcome. We are very excited to see you all here for round two of TA Tuesdays. All right, I'm just making sure our waiting room is set. Great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and dive in because there's a lot to do today and I'm very excited about it all. So again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's great to see you all in this space. This is the art of building relationships during COVID-19 and after the second session in our 2022 Teaching Artists Tuesdays series. Um, this is put together, by the way, this series is put together by the fabulous Teaching Artists Teaching Artists Affairs Committee from uh, the Roundtable. They've put so much work into this and we appreciate them so much. Um, my name is Kinsey Keck. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white cisgendered woman with uh, chin length, sort of wavy brown hair. I'm wearing large metal frame glasses and a very cozy mustard yellow shirt. I'm sitting in my kitchen. You can see my fridge behind me with lots of pictures and things on it. And I'm also the programming and membership manager for the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. The Roundtable is a grassroots service organization working to improve and advance the state of arts education through professional development workshops, advocacy and online resources and platforms to connect the arts at field. Although we are currently meeting via Zoom, the Roundtable would like to acknowledge that we do work and live on unceded lands. Manahata, or the place that is widely known as New York City, exists on the contemporary and ancestral homelands of the Canarsi, Lenape, Munsi, and Wappinger people. These sovereign nations and communities are still thriving here, and we continue to occupy their lands. So we would like to give a moment of respect to them, as well as to the Black and immigrant communities who have built the city that we know today as we recognize that all of our pasts, presents, and futures are intertwined, we would like to uplift uh, a couple of contemporary Indigenous arts organizations that we can all support and learn from. The first is the Lenape Center, and I will put um, a link to them in the chat. They host workshops and programs, symposia, lots of resources for folks in the area who want to deepen their understanding of the land that they live on and the thriving indigenous communities here. Um, I'll also uplift the Red Hawk Native American Arts Council. It's a nonprofit organization made up of representatives of multiple, di uh, multiple different indigenous identities. And they do also a lot of workshops um, and programming around many artistic disciplines to educate the public about indigenous heritage. So when you have a moment, please do check out these organizations and other organizations in your area, um, learn about them, learn from them, and most importantly, support them if you can. Thank you. Just a couple of reminders before we get going. So if you have any trouble with Zoom, I am your girl. Please just send me a private message and I will help you out. Um, please do remember to keep your mic setting on mute. If you're not on mute right now, please do mute yourself so that you can hear the people that are speaking. Uh, this workshop is going to be a bit interactive. We might ask you to come off of camera at times. If you're not comfortable with that, that's totally okay. If you are, we would love to see your face. Uh, we do encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions and share resources and connect with everyone else on the call. I will be saving a transcript of that and it will be sent to you within an, about a week or so. Um, I also want to note that this call does include closed captioning. So actually, you know, let me make sure that I've got that turned on. Yes. Okay. Now this call has closed captioning. So to Let's see, there we go. Uh, to access that, you're just gonna go to your toolbar at the bottom, click live transcript and show subtitle. I'll also note that this workshop is being recorded. The recording will be edited and uploaded to the Roundtable's YouTube channel and our website. I will also send you a link to that if you would like to have it um, within about a week or so once the video is edited and ready. And that is it from me. Thank you for your attention. It is now my sincere pleasure to introduce your facilitators for today. Taylor Valentine is the Manager of Program Excellence at LEAP, 
And Jennifer Mack Watkins is a teaching artist, practicing artist, and a consultant and founder of Learning Through Studio LLC TV. And Jennifer, take it away. Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm Jennifer Mack Watkins, and thank y'all for being here. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share with you just some of the things I've been able to take into the classroom in the field and just like learn about things through the moment as it's happening and, and, and continue to adapt and adjust my teaching to be able to help other teaching artists who are here or maybe even just to come join Karab Karabides just together, just to connect together, to um, be able to see how we could take everything that we are learning together and we're experiencing to connect here. And that's why we're here today. Um, I'm really excited that we're here and I'm ready to get started and um, TV, take it from here. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much to everybody for, um, for sharing the space and, and uh, inviting uh, me to be a part of this. Um, I just want to acknowledge that um, I just have questions. I really have questions. I have offerings. I don't have the answers. Um, I'm here to um, be a guide, and that's how I feel about my job as a teacher and a teaching artist, that I'm a steward for the young people that I serve, for the teachers that I serve, and how can we create, build, maintain, and, and grow relationships with our young people, with our participants to, yes, make art, but to also, like, build community, right? And... I, I am uh, afforded the opportunity to be the manager of program excellence at LEAP, which means I am um, very involved with the training and development of our, our youth facing staff. And as you all, sh I'm sure you all are aware, Kinsey, you can um, uh, possibly bring up the slide number four. Um, as I'm sure you are all aware, um, there's this whole COVID thing happening. Um, and uh, it has created a lot of disruption to our lives and to our worlds. And I'm just, you know, even now I, I'm, I'm talking with seasoned teaching artists who've been doing this for longer than I have. And they're coming to me saying, what can I do? How can I reach my young people? And so it is truly, um, truly a big question mark that is worth investigating at every level at every stage. So today, um, we are going to take us through basically three key principles of modeling that we feel um, are, are uh, important to this idea, the art of building relationships. Um, we're going to acknowledge for knowledge. Um, we're going to use a Padlet, uh, Padlet space for that, which some of you have already interacted with. and we're really excited to have a, uh, have a look at that. I want to talk about being true to who you are. Uh, with the Jamboard, and we're going to use this framework of making meaning through inquiry as well, and then we're going to reflect at the end. And so just to dive a little bit deep into the, the next slide of, of these three key, three key principles, right, um, right, there's, there's this huge disruption happening, right, and it's, and I know, I know we're all going through it, and that's probably why you showed up here into the space, and so in response, there's been this this huge push, this emphasis for social emotional learning and trauma informed teaching. But what does that mean for us? You know, what does that mean for us on the ground in the learning spaces? Next slide, please, Kinsey. So the question is, right, if we recognize social emotional learning as a reciprocal process, give and take, right, ascend and receive, that allows one to nurture relationships with ourselves, with the people around us and the world at large, then how can we prioritize those relationships and the building of those relationships in order to learn effectively and impact? Again, we're, we're talking about prioritizing, right? That comes first, even before the art. Teaching artists, yes, we teach art, but we have to artfully teach, right? We need to curate sequential experiences so we can build those meaningful connections. Um, and so that's sort of where we're at. And, and I think, you know, when we come to this idea of uh, acknowledging who our participants are, next slide, please, Kinsey. Um, we, we need to find out who they are. What do they bring? Who, what's their identity? What's their viewpoint? What do they bring to the space that can, um, where we can invite their wisdom and we can invite empathy into the room? And it ultimately lends to the sharing of power, right? And building that community. Being true to you. Right, we, we've heard the phrase, be authentic to your, be your authentic self. We hear that a lot these days, 
right? And these first two really go hand in hand, right? An impactful learning experience in a brave space have to start with the guide, the steward, the teacher. If we start with ourselves and be true to who we are, then we're inviting our participants to do the same. And making meaning, right? How do we- Funny how concrete... quickly it gets to be difficult to be at. Yes, it does get to be difficult. Um, and, and that's why we're here. And often we have these concrete learning points, right? We wanna, we wanna, we wanna create this experience where, where students learn something and then we move to the next one. But perhaps they didn't get a chance to really make meaning of what they learned or what they experienced. So I'm gonna take us through an activity and we're gonna sort of unpack a framework that allows us to, to make those connections and ask questions. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, pass it over to Jennifer. Okay, so I wanted to be able to share with you a really great experience of how to use Padlet in different ways. And I know everyone's probably have used it in different ways, but this way I wanted to show as a way to connect basically through the experiences that we have lived in through through the pandemic and continue to live through the pandemic. And so if you haven't had a chance to be able to react um, and reflect prior, I know that Kinsey sent out an email with the information of how to use the prompt and how to reflect. You can use everything from like your personal photographs, um, videos that you might wanna upload, um, writings, music, combination of photographs and text um, that will be happening in this space. And if you already have already reflected and responded, <coughs> then we're gonna give that time to you right now to be able to respond to at least two other people or more, okay? So Kinsey is gonna put on the music and we're gonna give you roughly about maybe three or four minutes. And if you have already responded to, to people, then continue to read and see how many people that you can, um, see how many people you can read in their reflections and maybe you can find connections just by reading more than two. So if Kinsey can go ahead and play the music, that'd be um, really great and we get started with the experience. Yes, gonna play right now. And I got um, I'm not sure how many folks have had the opportunity to add to the Padlet. I just wanna offer my gratitude and thanks for um, sharing uh, your whole selves um, through this Padlet. And also to acknowledge that we all have differing views and opinions about how COVID um, has operated in our worlds and our communities, um, the various different relationships we have with vaccines and with um, protecting ourselves and our communities. And that while we did offer a board for reflection and perspective, that there is no one way to look at how we respond to this COVID, um, this COVID thing, this pandemic, right? We all have, um, especially for marginalized communities uh, and, and folks who, who have a long history of, you know, navigating difficult um, systems, that there are a lot of differing opinions and perspectives, and we appreciate all of them. Baby, I'll be there too. Put on your napping dress. Perk him in a nice dress. Girl, I hope you like me. Midnight's black thought the outside, inside, you and I let the last one. There'll be the romance, way back in the day. The day. Midnight's black thought the outside, inside, you and I let the last one. There'll be the romance, in the back seat we did. We did. Okay, 
So thank you, thank you everyone for being able to take the time to reflect prior and during and acknowledging people who are in this space and that which is us together. And so I wanted to make sure that we had this time to make sure that everyone has taken time to share some very personal and very traumatic and just things that affected them and continue to affect them during this difficult time. And it's important to make sure that we always model what does that look like when we just slow down and it sometimes words don't need to be said um, verbally sometimes the, the most powerful words are our text are something that is written and I really saw that what was happening in the reflections and I was quite warmed and I felt like this was a really great way to uh, show that you can read the room before you even step into any space whether it be in person whether it's hybrid whether it whether it's virtual, this is a really great way to read the room. And it's one of the sources that I had when we first started teaching when um, COVID had began. Um, and we were given these tools at my school and, um, and we were said, here's your tools, now go in there, you know? And so I think we can kind of see how these tools, we can continue to suggest more tools together. And you'll see that in the working documents, but these are just tools that we're not saying we're the first people to ever use this, but let's think differently how we use these tools in different ways to just read the room and just to check in with, with um, one another. I've used palette in different ways from um, also using colors. Um, sometimes it's objects, sometimes um, it's songs. And so there's different ways of how you can read the room and how you can use these tools to just kind of see who how the students are feeling and, and we're able to see that's happening here with, um, with this reflection. So thank you for taking the time for sharing with us today. You know, I'm curious if, yeah, I'm just curious if anybody has any sort of immediate reflections or thoughts on, um, on their experience with Padlet <clears throat> about activity. Just wanna open the space to see if there was any reflections. Uh, yes, uh, I I didn't even think to, um, as Jennifer put it, to to read the room before before it opens. Um, so often, I was used to getting into the room and and having to to kind of get get that sense physically, and I never even thought about it even to this moment to consider the, what we're carrying into this one, into this square that we enter in. Uh, so I, I, I love the, the, the software, the Padlet, and it seems so easy even for someone who's not as tech savvy as I. So uh, I, I'm really grateful for that experience. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for sharing, Julio. And uh, Catherine, said, Catherine said in the chat that it was cool and it was nice that it can be anonymous which is that sort of like easy entry point, right? Where we can be involved without necessarily having to, to be exposed to. Can I add one more and, thing? To, um, one more please. thing, it's an app on your phone. So it's accessible. So let's say that you're in a classroom that doesn't have any, um, any computers, a cell phone, if there's space on your phone, mine's pretty full. Um, you can put the app on your on your phone, so you can definitely assess it access it from your phone as well. Yeah. Yeah. Laura says in the chat, uh, I love the options for how we can share images, words, poems, drawings, quotes, and really you can curate that experience to sort of get you to any different point in your lesson or your unit or wh whatever you're working on. Um, you can you can use it to your advantage, um, and and most importantly for for um, your participants to be able to share uh, according to who they are and what what the way they see the world. Great, thanks, Jill. Yeah, great. So um, you know, thinking about these the behavior, right? The the sort of mentor behaviors, the modeling behaviors of acknowledgement, right? We don't necessarily we're not necessarily restricted to being the, the in-person behaviors, right? We can use digital resources to acknowledge for knowledge. We can meet students where they are. We can take the time to check in, right? We can make it a check-in board. We can, um, we can find out who they are, like what'd you do this weekend? Like it could be a weekend board. It could be a, who's your superhero board, right? Could be any number of things. Um, and ultimately it's about 
asking questions and, and getting to know who, who your participants are and what they can what they bring into the space and how they see the world, right? Um, and you know, it could even be it could be even a, an opportunity to find out who's interested in being a leader in your classroom or who who wants to be specific, who wants to take over specific roles in your classroom, right? Um, and again, like these those these 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 tracks you're making, these different these little connections you're making that ultimately will build and become right and, and scaffold into this these opportunities for for leadership and true impactful learning. Um, and so. Yeah, that's this sort of thinking about how we acknowledge our students, what tools are at our disposal, and how we use that to sort of connect to who we are as well as, as stewards and teachers in the classroom. And then to, I think we're going to go in a little bit more depth with that back with Jennifer, talking about how we are true to who we are. Okay, waiting for Kinsey to share the screen. But I think I don't need to like wait for the screen, I can just go on. Um, so being true to who you are, it seems, it seems pretty simple, um, but I think it's really important to um, understand, like we have to know and feel comfortable who we are as a person as well. I know when I first started teaching, I definitely didn't feel comfortable talking in front of tons of students and peers and peers at a time. And, you know, seeing, um, you know, one of my first jobs is working in Harlem at a charter school. I, I saw over 700 students in one week. And it was, you know, I had to find ways to continuously to connect and build and, and going in, let's go back, like, let's go forward into the future, which is my future is now. Um, I teach college now. So out of the classroom, um, I, I teach college now and also do other workshops as well. But this particular experience, basically, I wanted to share my love for being able to connect with other artists. And I wanted to share my experience as an artist and how important it is to be able to build relationships um, whether it be virtual or in person. And so for me, I wanted to be able to get my students out of, you know, somewhere that was comfortable for them, which was the classroom. And I wanted to get them out of the classroom and into their local communities. Um, there's a local museum, you know, where I, where I live. And basically a lot of the students had never been. I'm like, wow, you have never been? Like when I lived in, you know, New York, New Jersey, I went to a lot of museums. You have to go to this museum. So I had to find a way to get them excited and um, not just to leave them out there on their own, but also to take the in-person uh, you know, experience of hearing what is an art lecture? Have you ever been? You know, what artists do you like? And so just trying to find ways to connect with them and, and making them know that I'm there for you. And I want like to hold their hands, not hold their hands, like, but like guide them. Like, this is what it, this experience feels like for me. And I wanted to model that. And so I first invited them to come to this event but before that even happened, I had to model relationships. So I reached out to the education coordinator and I was like, look, I want to have my students come here. What are some ways that we can connect and collaborate to have students come out of the classroom? And so I just introduced myself on in email and not knowing, you know, he would send back a paragraph of like, hey, we have this happening, this happening, this happening. If you're having problems, reach out. And I was like, wow, he actually responded. So I said, wow, I got to go the extra mile. I can't have this email come through and I can't make something happen you know, for the students. And so therefore I had to continue to build a relationship and he trust um, the fact that he wanted to have the students to connect with the artists, but it was, it's during COVID time. So that was not as easy, but there was an art talk. I invited the students there. I shared a biography about the artist. This artist is Noel Anderson, which you know, um, he is a New York artist and he's one of my favorite artists. And so he was in town and he had an exhibition called Heavy is a Crown. And so I wanted to kind of show them, okay, look, we can do an art lecture, and you can see his, see a body of work together, art as a voice. And so I got a chance to be able to take that um, in-person um, you know, experience and I had students to come. I actually had five students came, um, two students ended up taking an Uber and, um, and um, three of them drove together to support one another. And I, and I, I saw them in the crowd, I, I said, okay, I see you. And I even gave extra credit if they can even reflect about what they experienced. And so just making meaning, right? And so we're jumping ahead a little bit. And so I was really excited to know that um, I wanted them to feel like, okay, look, if I couldn't go to the in-person art lecture and I don't feel comfortable going, um, then there's another way I can connect with the artists. And so I decided to um, also introduce myself to this artist and um, Noel Anderson, and he already knew who I was. And I was like, this is like such a, you know, a big world, but small community because I'm a printmaker, he's a printmaker. And the fact that 
I never met him before in my life that he already knew. And my students were there. They're like, wow, like, you know, the artist, I'm like, he knows me, you know? And so like, I had to model that in that moment. And so um, I got a chance to connect with him and on the, the uh, museum got a chance to make this happen. And we um, worked together with the, with the college that I teach at. And we had a virtual, like a just like really intimate um, virtual conversation for the students. And I thought it was a really great way to show like, wow, art is important, not just like, you know, I'm going to learn about color from Ms. Michael Watkins, or I'm, I'm going to learn about, you know, how to view art, right? Art making, yes, it all will come. But I wanted to know that I, I wanted to be representative of like, I, I see myself as an artist and I connect with artists and how do you do that? So I, I modeled that by making this whole experience happen, made flyers, posted it on, on Instagram, um, you know, make sure I constantly emailed, here is the link, here is the time, here is a date, just to, as reminders to get them to come. And I was really, really happy to see that the students came in person. I was actually um, happy to see students come to the virtual experience as well. So something as simple as just like, okay, well, how do you, you know, introduce yourself? How do you talk to someone? Well, sometimes it's good for, for students to be able to see you model that in the moment and spontaneously unplanned. So um, I just wanted to share with you, you know, this was experience that I did. And I think it's important for us to continue to show that we can build relationships, right, during these times and find out the, find out the, the organizations and, and the schools who are already doing things and collaborate with people um, that you might not know. And it kind of expands the relationships even more. So I just wanted to share this with you and hopefully it inspires you to figure out how you can collaborate or, um, you know, get, get students comfortable with, you know, being talking, to, actually talking to an actual artist virtually. It doesn't have to be in person. Um, and I think that's the better way to show that, you know, <laughs> this is important. I'm modeling that. And this is how you build relationships. You have a hand raised. Hello, everybody. My name is Beata Tarasi. I just want to comment to this because I teach ballroom dancing in elementary schools, all, all five boroughs. I work at the organization called Dancing Classrooms and connected to the museums, which you can do in different arts. In dancing, we always talk to the students about, for example, the merengue, before we teach the merengue. Is there anybody in a classroom from the Dominican Republic? Where is the Dominican Republic? What is the capital of the Dominican Republic? What language they speak? How do they dance? Did you see your sisters, parents, mother, father, relatives dance? How is the music? Can we clap the rhythm? So the more and more children raise hands and they open up before we make any dance steps. And then when we connected, not just like as a community, but we actually got to know the culture a little bit, then we're going to start doing the steps. And, and that's how we bring our our cultures and other people's cultures into the room. So we all connect and that's how we build the, the dance. And when we talk about the Roomba, then we talk about Cuba. And then at the end, there's a showcase, like a culminating event, when we put the, as a slideshow on a computer, we put different pictures and music. And so we feel like we are in a country and we're dancing that particular dance. So that's the connection between in, in a dance area, in the dance art area. Thank you for letting me share this. Thank, thank you, Beata. I think I would like to be in your class. It sounds like I need to be there dancing too. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> in learning. <laughs> thank you. The next slide. So yeah, and I, I think what's really important about what Jennifer is saying is, is um, like, I was acknowledging like beforehand, yeah, really right, being, being super intentional uh, about who you are and what's important to you before you set out, right? It's like, I know about this artist. I know that he's gonna be holding a, a talk at this museum. So I'm gonna be really intentional because this is important to me, right? So, and I, I can't stress this enough, especially for our, our emerging teaching artists, right? It's understanding like who you are, what's important to you as a teacher, what are your beliefs, your philosophies, your values, right? Understanding that so you can shape your conversations and your lessons very intentionally. And as to speaking to what Beata said, as well as Jennifer, right? Sharing your cultural identity, showing your social and your artistic identity, right? People want to know that. People want to hear that. They want to they be involved with that. And um, as safe and, and as comfortable as you can be in sharing that, 
will open up those, uh, those spaces, particularly for young people. And I can't stress self-care enough, can't stress it enough, right? Thinking about how we take care of ourselves so we can come in and, and be able to nurture the relationships in our classroom, in our learning spaces. Because if we're not taking care of ourselves, we're short, we're short fused. We're reacting to the smallest things, right? We're, we're focused on, on, on the, the chaos as opposed to the, um, the peace, right? And so really like learning about what helps you regulate, what helps you take care of yourself and being able to incorporate that into your practice. So it's not the first step of your lesson isn't actually the icebreaker or the, or the conversation with your students. It's actually the thing that you do before you get to the classroom to make sure that you're in the right space you need to be, right? And um, Jennifer and I were talking about, and, and we were, I was putting this list together. She's like, there's something missing. There's something missing from this list. And what we came to is that, that transparency, right? And, and offering yourself up in a transparent way to know so that young people can, young people and, and, and adults can feel comfortable to be transparent right back, right? Be able to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Is there anyone in this room who can answer that question? Um, I think that that is a true, true essence of authenticity is that transparency. And for me, I know as a, as a teaching artist and a teacher, bringing the love is so important to me as a person and as a teacher. Um, and, and when you bring the love and you bring the joy, people can feel it. People can feel it. It's contagious, you know? And especially in these days, these times, having fun and joy in your experience is so, so important. So I invite you and encourage you to always be thinking about how are you bringing the fun? How are you bringing the joy? Stories. I think stories are one of the most beautiful ways of sharing yourself with your students and your participants. Um, even just talking about what you did the weekend or like this crazy thing that happened to me on the way to class. Um, it goes a long way in like establishing that connection and, and bringing back, right? And then bring your best self, right? If we want our students to bring their best selves, then we, it's on us to bring our best selves, right? Um, and yeah, so let's keep, let's keep investigating the idea of how do we bring our true selves to the classroom, but also to our artwork, right, Jennifer? Yeah, definitely. So I have a really great work to show with you, share with you guys today. Um, I went and it really thinks about like how we see ourselves in work. And I chose this work, but I don't want to tell you why I chose this work, but I want to see what you see you know, what do you think? What do you notice? What do you wonder? But before we get a little information about, you know, what do you think about this work? I want to share with you a quick bio about Emma Amos. And you can see um, the articles that are in the working resource. So if you want to learn more about her, I'm just going to give you a little tidbit, but just enough to kind of make you want to research more on your own if you're not familiar, but she was my absolute favorite artist. And um, I was like, when I saw this piece, I was like, wow, this connects with this presentation in so many different ways. And I think that you'll be able to notice that on your own. Um, Emma Amos was born in 1937 in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, she was able to start learning about art at a very young age. Her parents supported her. And um, she ended up taking some classes at Morris Brown, which is my alma mater, Atlanta GA. Um, and then after she left um, Atlanta, Georgia, she went to New York City. And she had, our ex she had our first, one of her first exhibitions there. But it was 1960. So you only can imagine what it was like for African-Americans to try to be able to share their works during these times. Because as you know, um, it was, we couldn't get into galleries because of the color of our skin. Um, and now on top of that, you know, her gender, her race, um, everything was, you know, was like making it very difficult to be able to see how she could make it as an artist in New York City. And so with time, you know, she took anything she could from being a, a you know, working at a, at a elementary school. She was assistant for an artist. And so she was trying to find a way and she found a way and she was able to network, build communities. And she ended up being one of the only first um, the first females and only females that was part of Ramirez Baden's group, the spiral group. And, um, and so that was a really great experience for her to just kind of like network with, with, with men in, in that group. And you can only imagine what, what I like if she's making work that had her in it, right? With, with um, to her being only female in the group. And, um, and so she was able to take her body of work as you can see, no matter what work you look at, she puts herself into it. And um, I don't want to give too much far away, but I want you to take this time. We're going to put music on. And um, I want you to take the time to, to ask yourself. You can put it in the chat. I'd like this for you guys to put it in the chat. What do you see? What do you notice? What do you think? And what do you wonder when you see the piece? And Kenzie, put the music on and you'll get a chance to look a little bit closer. 
you want to make sure you be able to provide, you know, examples just like this for your students as well. They could be something from a dance to a video to art, but we're looking at art today. Okay. All right. So hopefully you had a chance to be able to respond. And if we haven't had a chance, these resources are available for you in the resources. Um, I'm reading through the through the chat and I'm I'm really um, really interested in seeing, you know, how everyone is making their own um, like perspectives of what they think the work is about without knowing. And I feel like um, yes, these questions are kind of used in different ways. You can they're referenced to you know VTS very similar. I spent um, about six years working at the Brooklyn Museum, so we did a lot of VTS. But what I feel like over the couple of years I've discovered, I seem to like lean more towards the what do you see, what do you notice, think and wonder. And I think the key difference is, is that in the VTS, um, and I'd like to get your um, perspective too, um, is basically you're looking at what's happening in the picture, but I feel like it doesn't really always give you the chance to ask yourself like, you know, how do you, what do you question about the work? Um, and it doesn't really give notice to the to the uh, to the audience or the viewer looking at the piece and acknowledging that they already know something about the piece without knowing about it. And so I think the combination of combining the VTS strategy with um, you know the Project Zero is Harvard Harvard um, and other people use the same strategy too. But I think combining both of them together it makes it a very strong tool if you use it intentionally. Um, and so I think um, I want to give you a little bit more information about about her work. And so basically, uh, if you notice, you know, you see a lot of different X's. And so as you're looking at the X's, you know, think about why do you think she decided to put X's there? Um, you know, what's going on in the background? Like, yeah, it's very similar to the original teaching strategy, but ask yourself, what do you wonder? Why is she on a tightrope? Right. And what do you notice first? What stands out to you? and why. And so these are just different um, ways of um, thinking about like, how you can use these questions in the classroom. It can be anything from a dance, throw, some, throw, throw a dance uh, video up there, throw a photograph up there. And basically um, this piece is about her juggling her life as an African-American um, artist and who was a mother um, who was struggling between like, you know, the artist life and the mother life and being that she felt like she had to be, you know, have superpowers to be able to do these things. And so you can notice that there is a black cloak over her to hide her superpowers because you can't let everybody know that you have superpowers because people might try to, you know, do something to you or make you feel as though you're not, you know, that you don't need to be here. Um, but you can see how she takes subtle ways of taking costumes from the shirt she's wearing, which references um, a Gauguin painting um, to the cloak that she decided to put over you know, because, you know, super women, you know, she usually doesn't have anything, but why does she have to reveal herself, you know? So these things are all different ways of how to like, you know, show that, you know, she's not quite sure, you know, what she wants to do. Um, and I, I kind of felt like I chose this piece because I felt like, wow, that's how I felt about the pandemic and continue to feel about the pandemic as a, as a, um, as an artist, as a teaching artist, as a mother, and um, being able to keep, make sure my classroom is safe, making sure my family is safe, figuring out which direction. I think the most important thing to think about this piece, not just about what Emma Amos was, but like, where do you see yourself in the piece? And, um, and where do you gravitate to notice things um, a little bit deeper? And so um, just think about like, when you choose examples of, to show with your students, have your own connection. Don't just put it up there because, oh, I teach music, so I'm going to put up this, right? But I think it's, it comes naturally when you find ways to connect to the pieces that you're showing because it's helping you to show that, you know, that you are, you know, you're going through these things too. And I, you know, I'm, I know everyone's been in the classroom where you'd be like, wow, I'm, I'm really not sure how we're going to be able to get through this, but we're going to get through this together. And just knowing, just helping to build that community and being transparent, being true to yourself. Like it was very scary, right? Um, when we first started, you know, teaching during when the pandemic first started and it still is, um, but it's important for you to be able to recognize that in the classroom. Don't act like you, you know what to do and you know, you got your views about what you think about COVID. That's great, but um, you know, keep it to yourself and you're gonna figure out what's best for your, for your class and building community and um, making sure that, you know, if you are feeling a way, you're not going on a, on a tangent, but you're saying, look, I am not so sure. 
Um, I am a little bit scared, but we're going to get through this together. So I think as long as you continue to say together, build communities, reflect voices of the whole class, hear everybody out, find different ways of how to display that in different ways, digital way versus in person, you find a way to make a connection with your students. And back to the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Did you Thank want to you. move to the gym? Did you want to move to the gym board activity? Yes, I kind of got wrapped up in that because um, I really can't. <laughs> right. I did see <laughs> Megan's. I did see Megan's hand. Um, Megan, did you want to make an offer? I do. I have like one question about this painting. Um, as it's displayed here, is there the red board boundary on the outside with the two arrows on the top, or was that added afterwards? Wow, look at that. I, I've never I didn't seen even notice the arrows arrow. there. I think, oh, wow, didn't notice the arrows, but I think she's really well known. She's a weaver. So that that border that you're seeing um, is textiles. And um, she really, you know, she was able to combine her paintings and prints and, and textiles with her work. And I did notice the arrows, but um, I'm not sure, but it can be interpreted as you would like it to be. And that's um, fine. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for noticing. Yeah, no, of course. It's cool. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. No problem. Okay, Kinsey, the next slide. Okay, so now you get to make a jam. All right, so we go from looking at a work of art. Now we're going to make our own art jam. And this is a, a really great resource. I've used this in different ways from meetings and people sharing who they are about themselves. Um, making vision boards. Um, but in this case, we're gonna make your own digital work of art. And um, so basically the link is in the chat. You're gonna think of yourself inside, outside the classroom. You can choose anybody or, you know, maybe it's yourself. <laughs> maybe you have your own alter ego, who knows? Um, but basically you're gonna, you're gonna get a chance to make that happen. And so I'm gonna have Kenzie to share the screen. So if you're not familiar with Jamboard, it works very similar to PowerPoint, except I love it because it's like, um, because it's, it's in person, it's like live, right? And so is PowerPoint, but I think it's just really interactive tool. And, um, and you can see here, uh, the example that I chose, I chose Janelle Monet, um, because I really, really love her music. I love what she stands for. I love that she is totally herself and she isn't, you know, waiting for anyone to, you know, say that's not the way a singer is supposed to be. She has to dress like this. And so she's definitely her authentic self. And if you tied in Janelle Monet, um, basically Tightrope is a really famous song that she's known for. So check the lyrics out. And so Kenzie's going to show you um, how to, she's going to point and I'm going to describe to you how to use this. And so if you go to, she has the arrow over the set in the background. Um, and so basically if you click any of these are like kind of like bland, right? But they, they'll work. Um, maybe you want to go for something that's a little bit different and you click on the check, the check mark. And then it opens up a whole bunch of other ways how you can upload images from your computer, by website, taking a picture of yourself. Um, if she goes to Google image search, um, she can type in like Stripe backgrounds and they can come up and you'll see all the different images that appear here. Um, you can come from your Google Drive or also from your Google Photos. But um, so basically you can use that, that um, tool for that. And the toolbar over to the left, the pen tool, you can write on here, you can erase, you can use the arrow to move it and select it. Um, and you can see how TV has made his own oh. and um, looking for the pictures mm. to be there, but. Yeah, my image isn't on there, darn. Hmm. I think maybe it'll load in just a second. I feel like my computer's moving a little bit slow. I'm gonna refresh. <laughs> <clears throat> Whoa, that's okay. definitely not, but that's okay. okay. All right. Well, you can have text. You can be text-based, it's fine. Um, and, you can, um, and you can also use the sticky note, which is a square to add notes by your alter ego photographs if you would like to. Um, the picture, you can you know upload pictures. The circle tool is for making circles and the T for text is text and the zigzag thing is for laser. So take the time. If you keep putting the arrow at the very top, you can keep adding more and more slides on. So I like to see what people are gonna choose for their alter ego inside or outside the classroom. 
Okay. So try to fill your board with as many different pictures as possible, sticky notes, um, uh, anything that you would like to add to this to make it, make it seem like this is your alter ego. And maybe if you want to add an explanation, you can use the, the sticky notes for that as well. So we're going to put the music on. And this is another tool that you can use to um, be able to connect with your students. And Kenzie will put our our um our music on. She's she's doing a good job DJing. Yeah, I just want to. Acknowledge that some folks weren't able to um, create their own jam, um, but this, you know, while it is a digital resource and can sort of be the centerpiece of an activity like this, there are other opportunities to invite the same sort of collaboration, right? You know, maybe it's it's doing a, your own collage or doing your own drawing and then sharing and taking a picture and putting it up. Um, so there's definitely different ways of, of entering into that. We like Jamboard because it's, it's like in the moment, if there is an opportunity where everyone can have access to the tool, you can really see how people are, are contributing and adding and collaborating in real time. And um, what I love about this idea of like this alter ego, as we saw with Emma Amos, right? Emma Amos is trying to balance all of her different various identities and, and using her art to show that like we can use digital tools to do the same thing with our participants and allow them to sort of explore who they are and what they bring. Okay. So we will make sure that we share a second link. Yes, there is a limit for Jamboard. And so we, we were really surprised that there were so many people that came, but we'll make sure that we'll add a second Jamboard as well. And the Jamboard doesn't just stop, like it continues. So we can continue to do this even after the presentation is over. And just to kind of charm it with TV, like we are on virtual space. So that's why we're doing the Jamboard. But if we didn't have access to a computer, these type of things in person, or if you're on Zoom with no resources, there's different ways that students can share just something as a link to the person, right? Or a video or putting a JPEG of the person in the chat, right? If you're in person, right? You can find some magazines or they can draw, you know, who they see themselves, you know, as when they step into the classroom to learn, like what, it, it's more like a motivation. It's not to kind of see themselves as like switching back and forth between two different people, because that's not what we're talking about. Um, it's more of just like, what encourage you to continue to like, you know, who, right? And if you can see yourself, who do you see yourself as like, for example, Serena Williams, I use that a lot when we started the pandemic. And I talked, I thought about like her strength and like, you know, her endurance. And so I connected that to the students about through sports. So just trying to find connections um, and just something that can help students to feel comfortable talking about who they are, but in a visual form. So in all, in all aspects, we're not expecting for everybody to always have a Google account or like to have, you know, access to this, but if we're in a virtual space, then we all have a way to share links and JPEGs. But if we're in the classroom, of course, it'll be adapted and adjusted. So we wanna make sure that we understand that we are acknowledging that this can be accessible with no materials or some or a lot. Um, but in this case, most of the classrooms, you know, we always are adapting and adjusting at all times. And so it's important to be able to navigate, what do I have, what do I need and what, how can I make this work in, in a typical everyday scenario? Fantastic. All right. Um, we've got a little bit of time left. And so we're moving forward to our third principle of making meaning through inquiry. And I thought we would use just a, a feeder icebreaker to sort of uh, as our sort of our balance point. And then we'll reflect on that and we'll use the framework that I'm going to offer you up. So uh, I'm wondering if we have about nine or 10 brave volunteers uh, who would be willing to be on camera and on mic for this activity. We're just going to do a sound and movement activity and then we're going to reflect about it. So maybe um, use your raise hand chat. Yeah, put your raise hand in the um, in the window. And then if you have your hand raised, then pull your camera on. Uh, and if you don't have your hand raised, you can feel free to, you can leave your camera on if you'd like, or you can turn it off. 
And then we're gonna go to hide our video, non-video participants, which we do by scrolling over the dot, dot, dot in a non-video uh, 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 participant. And you will see an option to do just that, right? So if you wanna play, if you wanna play a little sound of movement exercise, go ahead and put the hand up and um, be, get ready to turn your mic on when, um, when it's time. Great, thank you all. Thank I see your beautiful hands. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay. I'm just gonna one last moment to invite anybody who wants to to come on camera. Great. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay, we can lower our hands. Love those hands, Jill. Thank you so much for your hands. Um, you can lower them from your, uh, the reactions from your windows. And this is called Woosh Wo Zing. Of my video participants here, who, who has heard of this game called Woosh Wo Zing? Let me just see your show of hands. Anybody? Anybody? Woosh Wo Zing. Maybe? Maybe? Gary? Would you be willing to share what your, your um, understanding of the Woosh Wo Zing game is? Um, I think I've played a version. It's kind of like Zip Zap Zop. Okay. Um, and what what's entailed in that? Uh, the phrases uh, have different um, movements, um, and they uh, and by different movements, um, they yes um, yes <laughs> yes. It's basically an energy game where we're going to be sending energy around the circle. Obviously, this uh, was a game developed when we were in person. It's, it's, uh, it's an, you know, typically we line up in a circle and we're sending energy around the circle and we're using words like whoosh, wo, and zing with gestures to send that. So um, our gesture, so the way we're going to do it in Zoom is we're going to say the name of the person that we're going to send the energy to. So for instance, oh, Jennifer, are you playing? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for instance, um, I'm going to use the gesture of like this for whoosh, right? So if everybody could do this gesture with me and just say whoosh, whoosh. Great. The only difference with Zoom is here is that we have to say the name of the person that we're going to send our energy to. So I would say Carrie whoosh. And then Carrie would find another name and she would say that person's name and go whoosh and so on and so forth around the circle. So maybe, maybe we can try that for a little bit, all right? So go ahead and turn your mics off. I mean, turn your mics on. Yeah, all right. And Carrie, do you wanna try sending a whoosh around? Yes. Okay. Um, Jahari, whoosh. Philomena, whoosh. Julia, whoosh. Jennifer, whoosh. <laughs> Sasha, woosh. <laughs> Beautiful, great. I'm gonna pause us there and we're gonna add our second sound and gesture. And our second sound and gesture is whoa. Whoa looks probably like, like a block. It's a block gesture because whoa actually sends the energy back to the person that was sending it. Right. So if if um, if Jennifer was sending me the energy, she would say. TV whoosh, I would say, whoa, that means Jennifer would then have to send a whoosh back to someone else, right? So now we have two elements into our game. We've got a whoosh and we have a whoa, all right? So um, who wants to start us off with a whoosh? And then feel free, Megan, great. And then feel free to add a whoa in whenever you want, y'all. And again, if, you, if you're, yes, but you have to send I it knew. to someone specifically. I knew. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoosh, Lila, whoosh, Ivan. Whoa, uh... whoa, sheesh. <laughs> right, keep going, Megan, send it, whoosh. try to try to get some whoosh Sorry. in there. Whoa, wow, so many woes. Whoosh, Jill, please. <laughs> Whoa! Whoosh! Let's Scott. get some whooshes in there. 
Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Uh, whoosh Filomino. Whoosh Sky. Whew. Whoosh Julio. Whoosh Ivan. <laughs> uh, whoosh Jill. Whoosh Julio. Whoosh Jahari. <laughs> Great. Pause. We're gonna pause there, and we're gonna add one more element. Jahari, you're gonna you're gonna be next. You're gonna start us off from the next one, okay? All right. We're gonna add one more element, and this is gonna be zing. Zing is usually when we're in a circle in person. Zing is to throw the energy across the circle, whereas whoosh would take us around. Zing would take us across. So we're gonna use a, a throwing gesture for zing. Everybody, try that with me. Zing. Mm -hmm. Great. And again, it's the name and zing, right? And you can woe a zing. You can whoa a whoosh, <laughs> right? And you can zing, everything's free. All right, Johari, ready? Yes. Okay. Okay. Anupama, zing. Megan, zing. Zing, TV. Whoosh, Jill. Uh, zing, Philomena. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Whoosh, Megan. Whoosh, Jennifer. <laughs> Whoosh, Carrie. Anu, Zing. Whoosh, Ivan. Johari, Zing. Great. Jahari, beautiful. Jahari, we're gonna we're gonna pause there. We're gonna pause there, and I just want to sort of want to know what's going on inside you right now. What what like how are you feeling? <laughs> how are you feeling, Jahari? What was that? What was that reaction that I just saw in your face? Confusion, but fun. Like not taking myself so seriously, and just really cool. just like you know being in in, in warm space with people. Nice. Yeah, I see some head nodding. Some tingly, tingly, tingly. Beautiful. Nice and like powerful. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I was just eager to to use the roast hand, just zing somebody. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And what did you notice? What did you see going on with the group as we as we went forward with this with this game? What did you notice? A lot more smiles. Yeah. yeah. Smile. Uh, it got harder to to notice the screen so much as as just looking at each other. The borders between the squares weren't so much uh, prevalent as they usually are when you're in this mode. Oh uh, yeah. And and what do you what do you notice about the words themselves? <laughs> the they, invitation they to silliness. To yeah, they allow your face to get all contorted in a fun way. <laughs> Whoosh. Yeah. What kind of words are they? Onomatopoeias. Onomatopoeia. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that? They mean? are. They're supposed to be sound words that sound like um, an action. Oh, great. Amazing. <laughs> awesome. Um, cool. So actually, we're going to do this again. But now uh, we're going to develop our own sound and gesture, all right? In, in an onomatopoeic fashion, <laughs> right? So I'm gonna choose something like pop, pop, and I'm gonna say, and so don't think about it too much, but we're thinking about a sound and a gesture that has the onomatopoeic fashion, and we're gonna send it to somebody. And as soon as you receive that, you come up with your own and you send it to somebody else. Here we go. Oh, Khadija says comic book words. I love that, Khadija. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so uh, turn your mics back on or unmute, if you will. And we're going to keep going forward. Now we're going to do our own sound and gesture. And I'm going to say, pop, Ivan. Boom, Jennifer. What? What did you say? Can't hear you. Kaboom, Ivan. Oh. Um, wee, Johari. <laughs> hey, Alamina. Sparkle, Megan. <laughs> Shazam, Anu. 
Hello, Carrie. Bing bong, Sky. <laughs> to Jill. <laughs> Zap. To Sky. Mm -hmm. To Jahari. Bam boom. Anupama. This is so fun. I don't want to stop you, but I have to stop you in the interest of time. Oh, <laughs> um, okay, so as we like started to develop our own version of this, now how did you, how did that feel? What what did you notice about that? Fun. Yeah. Still fun. Looser. Got looser. We were just like, got yeah, looser. let's go. Let's oh. go. Interesting. Did anyone feel more pressure that they had to come up with something? Initially, but not for long. Okay. Okay. So how do you, like, if we were to build on something next after this activity, what kind, what kind of experience would we do next, do you think? Your physical movement something? Physical movement something? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Physical. Something physical. Yeah. Well, how do you think this might relate to playwriting or, or play creation? You, it's almost like uh, sketching for 2D artists, just the warm up. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could actually do, a, as far as a sculptural thing you could do is, you could take what we just did and you could have the students take some aluminum foil and create a Giacometti type of uh, uh, person and then have them creating all the things that we just like pick one, Zoom yeah. or whatever. Yeah, totally. It. totally, there's so you, many possibilities. Speaking and emoting and um, interacting. Yeah. Yeah, in a certain absolutely. sort of way that brings like everything together. Yeah, Khadija what? says you could connect it to your alter ego idea, which is great. I love that. What I about that. A, what about a um, for the action that's made as a reaction that must happen? Like it right. causes something in right. the it's new response. Cause and effect. A dialogue, right? So I've used this activity to actually devise short plays for young people using sound and movement, right? So if you have a number of students, you can take, you can group them out. You, they hold on to their own sound and gesture and you give them a few minutes to sequence it. Like uh, Carrie mentioned in the chat, you sequence it, you repeat it, you add tempo, you slow it down, you speed it up, you add duration, right? And you can actually create a narrative just out of sound and movement. And that sort of is like that nice entry point into devising and how we can create a story from nothing essentially, right? So. Thank you all very much for your willingness and your bravery for, for jumping into this activity. We've only got a few minutes left, so I'm gonna breeze through what I just did for, with you in terms of reflection. Um, Kinsey, could you um, show the slides, please? Um, and thank you all to those who didn't participate for, for hanging on with us and being observers and, and adding to the chat. Um, I saw some great ideas. Joy um, talked about line add-on improv. Absolutely, we could add lines onto the sounds. Great. So what, what I just took you through is how did you, what did you feel? How, what did you notice? How does it connect? Um, and what might come next um, comes from David Cobb's experiential learning cycle, which he established in 1984. This is a very scientific, very um, systematic uh, sort of academic way of approaching it. And I when I first experienced it, I loved it. I really, really, truly loved it. And so I wanted to keep incorporating it into my practice. And what I found was that students really responded to it. They really responded to understanding why something is in its place and how it was making them feel and, and what they saw when, when they were working with the group and why it was important to them in their own personal lives. Can you take it to the next slide, please, Kinsey? Um, and so... I sort of sort of tweaked it and innovated it here with my folks, my colleagues here at LEAP. And this is sort of where I came to, right? Is this idea that we're gonna experience something. And oftentimes I ask young people in particular to describe what we just did, to actually take them through 
what we just did so that they get used to being able to explain something, which is not necessarily the easiest thing to do, right? There's like an art to description, right? And then we move into the I, me space of sharing. How does it feel? And I think it was, I think it was um, Anu that said, um, that, yeah, that tingling sensation, right? Like what were the sensations you felt as you did this thing? How did you feel when you, when you looked at Emma Amos's painting, right? Um, and then that was one of the questions that Jennifer asked. It's like, what did you notice or see as, what, as you're looking at this? What did you notice with the group, right? We're opening it up now to the people around us. What did we notice about the group? We saw people moving, we saw people smiling. We, we, the energy was infectious in the activity. And then we're gonna move it into the why, right? So we started with the what, which is the experience. We moved into the why, the describing, right? Then we moved into the how did it feel and, and what was going on with the group? How did, it, how did it unpack? And now we're moving it back to the why. Why does this connect to me, right? How does it connect to me? And we talked about how it connected to theater, how it could possibly be um, an onomatopoeia onom onom um, vocabulary uh, moment, right? Like incorporating vocabulary into your theater experience. And then moving forward to like, how are we gonna incorporate into the next? What's gonna come after this? How can we use what we did today and incorporate it into the next experience? And so, what I love about this framework, and I, and I invite you to bring that into your practice. Um, it takes practice, first of all, um, just keep continually asking these questions. But what I love about it is there's a lot of benefits from doing it. Uh, next slide, please, Kinsey. Um, what it does is it sort of promotes this community of conversation. The more we can ask questions, the more questions will be asked back to us, right? And you can see, I'm not gonna take us through all these things, but there's a lot of benefits in using this framework to connect experiences, whether you're making a sculpture out of foil, whether you're doing a dance choreography um, to, uh, uh, in the vein of watercolor, whether you're doing a theater experience or whether you're doing, uh, looking at a piece of art, there are so many benefits to using this framework to connect the learning points. And what I, particularly what I love about it is the more you do it, the more students will be ready to ask the questions before you even get there. You're like, yo, 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 Mr. 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 I felt like this, I felt like this, right? And they're like, I don't even get to ask the question. And, and I just like, it makes, it really warms my heart when, when students are stepping up and like, like activating into the space before I even, I can like, that's the whole, for me, that's what it's all about. It's students owning the space and owning their creativity and owning their leadership. Um, so yeah. Well, was a, that was like a that was a Cliff Notes version, um, but I I love this uh, framework and I and I I hope that you all might find some value in it as well as you um, bring art experiences to your young people and your adult people as well, um, and that sort of brings us to our last moment of reflection. Um, maybe we can just open up the room and and chat. Yeah, Jennifer. How was that for you being part of a theater activity? Uh, awkward. I, I mean, when we first did it, like before the uh, the presentation, we were practicing. I said, can you get your hand on my face? Like, I felt like when we first did it together, when it was just TV and I, like his hands was real close. But when it was as a group, <laughs> it felt, it didn't feel like he, like anyone was intruding in my space. But when it was just TV and I, it felt, it felt different. And it felt like, I felt like we were all together. And like someone said, you know, you can kind of feel the energy through the border there. But I definitely enjoyed being an observer and participating to a point. But anything that is in my face, you know, whether it be in person or not, it, it just felt different. But I definitely liked playing the game. And it was awkward, but it was fun to see everyone's smiles on their faces. Indeed. <laughs> so we're just going to open up to, to the folks in the, in the room, uh, video or not video, mic or not mic, chat or not chat. What, what, um, what resonated with you today and why? And what do you wanna take away from today and bring into your practice for building relationships with your students? I'm just gonna sort of open it up. Can I go? Please. Um, so I'm, uh, I teach dance and I'm right now in the middle of a residency teaching um, South African boot dance. Um, and so what, what, I, what my takeaway was, was in terms of the, the whoosh and zinging, um, this is kind of Morse code 
that that can occur and have the students co-create this kind of new uh, body English and language through sound. So the you can start to incorporate um, some other kinds of things into our um, into our dance uh, that we are co-creating. So yeah, I'm really excited. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank well, you. Yeah, Julio. I have to say that it, it felt um, uh, weirdly validating in the sense of, 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 from the perspective of a teaching artist, of, of what we've been doing through the pandemic. Um, at, over, over the summer, um, I had a month long project with students um, who for the first time since the beginning, got to see each other in person for a short time. And um, as you were mentioning about like getting them to answer the questions before they even, before you even prompt them, they like, they come in already eager. I didn't notice that until the, until the first week that they just came ready. They came eager and it made me think, wow, this is something I wish all the teaching artists I've known continue to do kind of like find that that mode and get their students to do just that. And uh, what I take from this is just not only the validation, but some of these really cool ideas I, again, haven't thought about before um, until now. So thank you. I wanna thank this program. Um, I just really like the energy that you all put into it. Um, and I'm very curious about the apps that you uh, share to this. I can really see using them as a pre-classroom uh, kind of a thing, like some people talked about. I have never even used this yet, so this is very exciting to me to move forward with this. Thank you, Jill. Tasha, I see your hand. Hey, y'all. Uh, hey. So for me, what I was coming up, um, what was coming up is a. Uh, I work for the Creative Center. I don't know if anyone's familiar with them. Uh, a lot of our um, learners are people who've experienced um, cancer or have chronic illness and things like that. I actually work with them. Um, I help to schedule programming. So also if anyone's interested in teaching um, people who have had those experiences and caregivers, just reach out to me. Um, but like, this is also something not just for like youth. Right. These are some of the tools that I'm thinking about that I can use with some as we facilitate classes with older people, aging population. A lot of times um, they're not considered in these conversations as teaching artists, but like as teaching artists, like we show up in all areas and facets of our lives. And so I think that the conversation should also expand to like these are tools not only within the classrooms, but like in community centers and in, in senior homes and stuff like that, because they too want to feel engaged. Just, just because I'm aging doesn't mean that I can't incorporate movement within my practice. So um, I think it's important to bring that dialogue into the conversation as we're um, expanding our resources and our, our, our arsenal. And then I'll put my email um, in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tasha. Anupama, is that, did I say that correctly? Yes, yes. Um, um, I found that the movement, of, first of all, taking the temperature of the room, that was a great idea. I, I'm echoing that, I know. Um, uh, that's something I'll like want to do uh, prior to classes. But um, the movement, um, I think, yes, should be more incorporated, especially because uh, the re I couldn't reassure my students with uh, smiles, like I, I was wearing a mask, the students were wearing masks, but the body language that actually picked up in the classroom. Some students did have get other motions when they were positive about something, like a little bit of a this in the class. And I was uh, going over some um, body language exercises for drawing um, to draw characters. So almost uh, maybe with in the absence of the ex the extreme facial expressions we can use with our mouths, these 
hand gestures and other gestures can help uh, convey the messages, the emotional messages we want for now at least. So I like this. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Kinsey, how are we doing on time? We're coming close to the end. I think we have time for another share. We have about three minutes left. Great. Um, I want to invite Sarah and then Beata, and then we can close it out. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to emphasize how much I appreciated all, all this um, focus on a sense of fun. Um, my students are, you know, we're all hurting and they're hurting. And um, what I loved about this game and I loved about all of the um, work that you sort of shared with us today was that sort of total engagement um, to give them a break from ha having the heaviness of what they're um, feeling burdened by. They have a lot of work that's being still expected of them academically and um, I find that they they really even more so now need ways to easily just shift gears and engage in something um, something fun. <laughs> so I really appreciated that. Thank you. Thank you. Beata, you want to close this out? Yes, question? I would like, I thank you so much again for this. This is very helpful. I really loved um, Emma Amos's uh, painting and how we had to analyze and what it means for us. And my favorite quote for today is, I think, um, I don't know who said that, I'm not sure. But when you choose an art, music or movement and put it out for the students, make sure you have your own connection to that piece. I love that. That's like really... How, what I, what is my connection, what I feel about that, what do you feel about that, and it can be any kind of art. So I love that sentence, so thank you so much. I wrote that down. And thanks for everybody sharing your thoughts and your opinion, and um, it was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm very honored to have been part of this, and, uh, and I'm really honored to work with Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Kinsey, and thank you, everyone, for being here. And I'll I want to thank y'all for coming here and, and taking the time during dinner time. It's dinner time now, right? So y'all get to go right in from a great activity and getting a chance to learn and talk to one another. Hopefully you can share your contacts. Maybe you can add your contacts to the working document so we can continue the conversation after the presentation is over. Because I, I kind of want to just eat dinner and, you know, continue to like have conversations with everyone. But I think I'm definitely thinking about making sure we continue to add to this dialogue, thinking about senior citizens, think about students from all ages down from like, you know, pre-K up to like a hundred, you know, cause we're all dealing with this virtual space. So um, definitely this working doc is gonna continue, right? Cause you're gonna keep adding to this as you think about it. Ah, oh, I remember we went to this workshop. Um, let me add something to this. Um, and, you know, using the Jamboard, I'm feeling away today. Let me add a Jamboard, you know, something today. Um, I feel like I want to add something to the palette. I felt this way today. So continue to have these documents and these different apps to continue to connect with one another, continue to respond. Um, I've been to so many different workshops and when I want to give a shout out to Sonnet, um, I got a chance to go to CWI was a workshop that was um, based in California Community Works Institute. And we did this for a whole week and it was awkward. Like we record each other, we interview each other, we use palette in different ways. But it forced me to like, you know what, we're going to be in this virtual space. I got to be comfortable with it. And so I think the more that you continue to, to try new things, continue to connect with one another, to use each other for resources, you'll feel more comfortable um, along the way. And if you don't feel comfortable, then reach out to someone. And thank you all for coming here today. And hopefully you continue to come to other workshops as well. I'm going to close it out. But Megan, did you have a question first? I do real quick. Um, is the Jamboard the way to reach out to people who are here right now, or is it through a document that I didn't see? There are a couple of ways. You can put your info in the chat. The chat is going to be saved and shared to everyone. In the chat, if you scroll up just a little bit, Taylor also shared a working resource doc that we created specifically for this session. Um, I will be sending in a follow-up email to you all, a link to look at the Padlet, to the Jamboards. Um, I created a second Jamboard so that if anyone wants to go back and interact, we can do that too. 
Um, so I will send you all of those and this resource doc. The resource doc is also going to live in the resource library on the Roundtable website. So there will be multiple ways to access, but I promise I will send it to you all so that you have it because um, I know it's kind of a quick turnaround to grab everything. Um, and I just want to give a massive thank you again to Jennifer and TV. Uh, you two are just so wonderful. And tonight was, I love the energy in the space and you shared, I can't believe how much information actually that you shared in this very short period of time. So thank you so much for all that you do. We appreciate you. And I want to say thank you to the Teaching Artist Affairs Committee who helped make this possible. Um, and thank you, of course, to you all for being here. Um, we appreciate you so much. So I am going to put a link in the chat to a survey. It should also pop up automatically when you leave this um, meeting. And you may have filled it out last week, but we'd love to hear fresh feedback on today if you have a moment. If not, I will also send this via email. Um, and I just want to encourage you all also to join us next week for our last TA Tuesdays session that's going to be considering the Healing Centered Arts Classroom on Tuesday, January 25th from 4 to 515. So if you haven't registered, you can do so at the link right there in the chat. And that is all. I hope you have a lovely Tuesday evening. Take care. And I hope to see you all soon.